I'm Kelly Powers from Creative Catalyst Productions. I sat down with Linda Baker after the production of her DVD workshop, Layers of Design in Watercolor, to discuss her life, career, and art. In part one of our two-part interview, Linda talks about the difficulties of defining yourself as a professional artist and explains how she developed an original style. Linda Baker's DVD, Layers of Design in Watercolor, is available now at ccpvideos.com. Linda Baker, welcome to Creative Catalyst. First, how did you feel it went, the video? Was it different than you thought it would be? Totally. You, you seem to get more comfortable as we went. I'm the most comfortable right now as I'm going home. <laughs> Perfect. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> no, you did a very good job of preparing me for that. So I did know what to expect. What I didn't know is how my painting would do. I didn't know how I would perform. If I'd known more about that, it would have been more comfortable. But you feel pretty good with how? I really like what we've got. I think we got some very interesting things for people to see and hear. Well, I was surprised how you very rarely cleaned your palette. You cleaned it occasionally, but you said that you liked having colors in there, and then you brought those colors as you went with the painting together. For one thing, I needed to make money in art, so I couldn't spend all my money on new tubes of paint. So I don't like to waste paint. I don't like to waste anything. The other side of that is that I just leave the paint in my palette all the time. The only time you saw me clean out my palette was if you asked for a real pure little demo or something. I like to start with whatever is in my palette and mix a little bit of mud. And people always say your colors are so luminous and they're not. They're grayed down. One of the reasons I like layering is because when I pour it on or I just softly drizzle it over top of the surface of the paper, it stays very luminous and you can put color over color over color and never get mud. You just get this sort of a glow that comes through. I think the layering for me came somewhat from my college experience. I really loved printmaking. I like sort of the negativity of it, that you did it one way and then when you ran it through the press it came out another way. I liked the preparing and sort of the muddy, inky look you got from the printmaking. I think I liked the anticipation. If you're in printmaking and do a very serious metal etching or something of that, you spend a long time inking that plate and rubbing it out and inking it and getting it just the way you want it. And then you run it through the press and you get a little surprise at what you get. And I kind of think I like this in my layering. When I first do my sketch and I have this vision in my mind, there's this whole process that builds up. And it's all me anticipating whether or not I can accomplish this in the end. And I don't know until the end what it looks like. So for me, it's really enjoying the journey. I just love the process. I first started out doing just a layer of masking and taking it off and direct painting everything. And then I figured out, well, I could put a couple layers on, two or three layers of masking, and get a light, mid, and a dark. And then I realized that if I picked a very complicated subject and I really broke it down, I could milk this for a long time and have a really nice, long experience. of. So for me, it's a big challenge of how many values I can break it down to and how many nuances I can get when I pull all that masking off at the end. So it's just sort of a personal, <laughs> personal game for me. How did you get into art? This is the world's greatest mystery. There are no artists in my family, none. My grandparents, my aunts, uncles, really nobody is an artist. And as a child, I was interested in art, but that wasn't my focus. When I went to high school, my focus was college prep. And when I went to college and somebody said, what do you want to study? I said, I want to study art. And I had never had an art class. So I became an art major in college, sort of just right out of the blue and uh, fell in love with it. I love everything about art. I realize as I age, I'm a born artist. I was born to design, to create. When I cook, I cut my vegetables and put them in little sections and color coordinate them. I color coordinate my linen drawer. I color coordinate my t-shirts. It's just innate in me. And I decorate everybody's room when I walk in the door. I somewhere throughout the evening will suggest that if they move their couch on an angle, they would have a better feng shui in their room and, and it would work better <laughs> with their layout. So it just seems to be in me. How did you get into the career you have now? So I was art, an art major in college. From there, I didn't finish my degree. I was going to be a high school art teacher. And because I didn't get that degree, I ended up getting married, uh, having a family. And our family business was in building racing engines, sort of a long way from art. And because it was a family business, my husband and I ran the business, and so I was pretty involved with that. I would do art occasionally. I, on a vacation, when I had a little time to myself, a day off or whatever, I would go out and sketch and paint and that kind of thing. And I would enter occasionally local shows right up until 1989. 
In 1989, we were building a house, and there was a three-stall garage. And I said to my husband, so what happens to that space over that garage? And he said, well, it's rafters or, you know, whatever. And I said, mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. I said, could we make that a room over the garage? I said, I would like to have a studio. And he said, what are you going to do with your studio? And I said, well, that's the other thing I was going to mention to you. I would like to leave the family business, and I would like to be a full-time artist. That's a huge decision. How did you realize that for yourself? Well, I had been painting more and more along the way and finding it hard to sandwich it in. I was winning some local awards. I was very interested in it, and that's really where my passion was. Um, my husband's passion was building racing engines, and book work was not my passion or running a shop full of guys. <laughs> so, so I decided that I really wanted to do this, and I guess I had been thinking about it for a while, and I had never said it out loud. But the most interesting thing he said to me is, you know, I don't have so much of a problem with that, except that you are half of our income. So what will we do about that? And I just answered just as confident as I didn't feel and said, oh, I'm going to make money. And so when we finished the studio over the garage, moved up there, and I painted incessantly, day and night. And I realized that I was going to need to tune up my knowledge and get there in a hurry. Ordered books, videos, anything I could find to learn from. Took workshops around the country, and I was on sort of the fast lane to learn quick. And then I decided if I needed to make money at this, the best way to make money was to paint very saleable subject matter. So after I got a little body of work together, I went around to all local art centers, libraries, churches, anything in the area within about a 50-mile radius, and I had a show a month for a year. Oh my God. And I would just take it from one venue, and whatever wasn't sold, I would add whatever I had created during that month, and then I would move it to the next venue. So during that year, several things happened. And it wasn't intentional. It just sort of worked out well for me. I was getting lots of publicity. The papers were running my openings. The newspaper came and did a story on me because they saw my name month after month, these different venues. Several galleries took an interest in me, and so I was actually able to select the gallery I wanted instead of just falling into a local co-op. A local co-op, that's interesting. I initially uh, went down to our local co-op, which I thought the only prerequisite was that you had to work one day a week to be in the local co-op. And I think I'm the first person in history to get rejected from my local co-op. <laughs> it was devastating to me. But anyway, maybe it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I had to go beyond my local boundaries. I got invited to a very good gallery. They picked me up, so I didn't ever have to take my portfolio and present it. And in the process of all of this, someone came up to me and said, would you be interested in reproducing some of your artwork? And I'm an agent. So right off the bat, I sort of got thrown right into the fast lane. So I started showing at the local gallery. I reproduced some of my images, and this agent carries nine artists and promoted me. So I have dealers in three different states that he represented. So that was kind of huge for me. You were on this fast track. How did you develop your style, the style that we worked on this week? How has that evolved from the style that you started in that first studio? That's a pretty serious evolution for me because... When my husband said those magic words like, you will have to make some money, you will have to contribute. So my choices were to get a job and try to do this, my art on the side, or work in the family business, which had completely consumed me, or really, you know, hit my art hard. So I did things like outdoor shows and that kind of thing. So I realized saleable subject matter. So I started with things like florals, landscapes, uh, one of the demos I did this week of the tree painting has been with me from the very, very beginning. I've done it for 30 years now. And those things sold rather quickly. I realized the tree series, the nature scene, worked well in corporate offices, so I painted them huge. I went to double elephant size, 30 by 42 watercolor paper, and then we'd get it all framed up. It'll handle the lobby of a corporate office. And the nature was sort of non-intimidating for businesses, banks, a lot of banks picked up, a lot of hospitals. There was one point where a decorator came to me and said, one of the local hospitals has decided that they're going to put art in all the patients' rooms. I said, oh, how wonderful. I said, well, they just got a donor to pick up the tab on that. And I said, great. And she said, so we would like you to paint a painting for each one of the 
third floor rooms. I said, this is wonderful. She said, but here's the problem. She said, it's 30 paintings. I said, great. She said, we open in a month. I said, no way. And she said, we can only take what you have done at the time of the opening because the opening was going to be a big political splash and this donor wanted his stuff shown. So I thought, what can I paint fast? So I thought close-up florals, and I went close, close-up florals, just the center of a flower or the essence of a flower. And what I learned was that if I painted them fast and loose, they had a certain charm about them. And one of my friends dubbed me one a day because I painted 30 paintings in 30 days, met my deadline, and some of them were large. Some of them were great big double elephant size, and then some of them were small half sheets, but most of them were a full sheet painting. And so then how did you get to your current series, and was that hard to break away from sort of that which you knew which could sell to something that you weren't sure if it was marketable, but maybe was truer to you? So a couple things happened. For one thing, our children had grown up and mostly moved out of the house, and our college expenses were waning, and so I didn't have to make as much income to support the family. So that was one sort of turning point for me. Another turning point was kind of a devastating experience for me. I went to a uh, Ohio Stretching Boundaries Symposium one year, and they offered a critique from somebody pretty well known in the art industry, a real hero of mine, Ed Betts. And they had about 200 people in the auditorium and did a, a critique on each person's painting. He would talk about them. And I could tell it had gone on for an hour and a half, two hours. I knew he was tired. I saw his critiques getting tougher. I knew I hadn't come across the stage yet. And I thought to myself, this is going to hurt. Ouch. I just sort of felt it coming. So when it was time for my pieces to come up, um, I'd done what I thought were a couple of nice florals, very nicely framed. I was the very last person, the very last. And they put my paintings up there. And he turned around and he said, if this is all you're going to do with your talent, I think you should burn your brushes. Well, I was embarrassed and humiliated and devastated, and I'd come with a bunch of friends that were just feeling very bad for me, and I was having an allergy attack, and for the next three days, everybody I saw would say, aren't you the one? I'd say, yes, yep, burn your brushes, yep, that was me. That would be me. So I went home pretty uh, upset and devastated, but I started thinking a little bit about what he had said. And he didn't say anything that negative. He said, if that's all you're going to do with your skill and talent. So as all I heard was burn your brushes. And after I thought about it a little bit, I thought, okay, so what could I paint? What would I paint if I wanted to make a statement? He basically was saying to me, there's some skill level here, but you have no content. You're not telling a story. You're just doing a pretty flower. And I had been doing a lot of pretty paintings. I was painting wicker chairs on the porch and things that were just very pleasing, sort of vacation scenery type of things. One of the things that really helped my career along was that I was invited to do a calendar for the island of Martha's Vineyard two years in a row. So I painted all 12 months and then reproduced them as prints and giclés, and so that was a good part of my income. So I thought to myself, what would I paint? And then I thought one step further. And I, maybe it was the first time that I had really thought about it. If I didn't have to make a dime, if it didn't matter to me what happened to my work, what would I paint? What do I want to say and what is my vision? I love florals and I still paint florals, but my vision is quite different from that. Uh, my husband was changing our lawn furniture out on our deck for seasons. I think it was in the spring. So he was bringing it out. And it was all piled up in this jumble on the deck. And he was about to sort it out and put it in place. And I turned around and I said, don't touch that lawn furniture. I'm going to paint that. And I showed um, some sketches and photographs to a friend. And they said, oh, I don't think so. I don't see anything there. But somehow I saw something there. So I painted this pile of lawn furniture all piled up, called it anticipation because you didn't know if it was being put away or coming out. You didn't know if it was the end of the season, the beginning of the season. I was pretty pleased with the painting, and so I saw in a magazine that Ed Betts was a juror for, I think it was Texas Watercolor. So I entered the show, and he accepted my painting, and then he gave it an award. So I wrote him a letter, and I said to him, <laughs> and now he has passed away, but I, I think he would enjoy this story. I said to him a couple months ago or a few months ago, you told me to burn my brushes, and I guess I should thank you for that. I didn't burn my brushes. I thought about what you had said, and I've now painted something that you have not only selected into a national show, you have given an award. So I have to thank you for shoving me out of my comfort zone. 
And then at the end of the letter, I said, but I have to tell you that your bedside manner can use some improvement. <laughs> and to my surprise, he wrote back like a five page personal letter to me and telling me that he'd had students all his life and that this was the end of his life and he didn't have time for pleasantries and to be nice about it, he said if he saw somebody that had some talent, he just said right out, do something with that talent, don't wait. So that was a real turning point for me when I didn't need to make money and somebody had just shoved me out of my comfort zone and said, what do you want to say to the universe? So my lawn furniture series was one of my first big series and for a long time I was known as the chair lady. <laughs> Do you think from a marketing standpoint, and if you want to be a professional artist, do you feel like it's important to have a consistent style? I don't think anybody ever gets remembered for being the same as somebody else. You get remembered for being your own self and true to your own style. And somewhere along the line, maybe breaking through the norm, changing the rules, changing up the color a little bit, somehow something that somebody says, that's Linda Baker. So in the beginning, people said, oh, you paint nice, or that's a nice painting. And as time went on, people would say, I'd recognize your paintings anywhere. And now people will say to me, oh, I knew that was a Linda Baker. And then I think, yes, I have found myself. And I didn't find my style through taking 20 workshops and saying, oh, I think I want to do this style, or I think I want to paint like this artist. Uh, I tried to gain knowledge from each of those. And my whole challenge and goal was to try to incorporate that into my style. So when somebody says, oh, I knew that was a Linda Baker, that's a supreme compliment to me because it says that who I am, all my life experience, everything I like, everything I believe in, my vision, everything has come through on that piece of paper. And it says that's a Linda Baker. How do you recommend to students who are just getting started out to find their style instead of glomming on to the Linda Baker style? Because I feel like students, when they're first starting out, they need to have a result and it's the result that makes them feel confident enough to go forward. So how do they ever break out of the product cycle and really advance in their art? That answer is easy. Paint. You can't be a non-painting artist. You have to spend time in your studio. You have to spend time with your materials. Maybe you like brushes. Maybe you like pouring. Maybe you like scumbling. Maybe you like encaustic and wax. Maybe you like mixed media. Whatever you like, you have to spend time with it. And the longer you spend with it, the less you'll be affected by somebody else. Even though you might be interested in what they do, the longer you spend with it, the more it will become yours. So I think the whole secret to finding one style is to make art. What is the importance of drawing? It's interesting that you ask that because in the beginning, I wanted to draw really well. And I realized that was one of the skill levels that for me wasn't strong enough. So when I decided I was gonna be this full-time professional artist and went at it with a frenzy, got myself sketchbooks and I would sit down every night and I would draw the TV and I'd draw my husband in the chair snoring and I would draw the food on the table that we'd had for dinner and draw, 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 draw because I wanted to develop that skill because I did not want my art to be inhibited through lack of ability. So when I finally got my drawing skills up to speed, I could now do a wicker chair, I could do a porch, I could do fish, I could do wildlife, I could do whatever I wanted, I could do a, a portrait. I wasn't limited by my skill level. Then you have the choice. Maybe I was gonna be an abstract painter, maybe I wasn't going to stay with my drawing. Uh, if you look at some of the best abstract artists in history, their drawing ability is incredible. If you look at an early Picasso, amazing drawing skill. And then you look at a later Picasso and you realize he has made it his own and he's put his own personality into that. Whether or not you like his sort of bizarre you know, impression of it, he definitely made it his. So when you gain the skill, then you get to decide whether it's important to you. If you don't have the skill, you don't have a choice. When did you start feeling confident calling yourself an artist? And what changed in you to be able to call yourself an artist? In the early years, I said, I paint. You know, what do you do for fun? Well, I paint. But I wouldn't say I was an artist because I didn't feel comfortable saying I was an artist. When I said I'm going to be a full-time professional artist, that was a big mouthful for me. That was me telling myself and the world that I was going to take this seriously and I was going to try to make a difference. So when students come to my workshop and they say, well, I'm not really an artist, I just paint once in a while, or I just like it, but I'm not really an artist, I tell them the very first day, if you're sitting in this classroom, you're an artist. Because you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a high interest level, 
If you weren't intrigued by making and creating, you wouldn't be here. So always say that you're an artist. Maybe you're an untrained artist because Edgar Whitney said, art is as rational as any skill. It needs to be learned. So the interest is what makes us an artist. The skill level is up to us. Every day you were here, we learned about 10 more things going on in your life. <laughs> you have a very busy life. <laughs> and how did you make time for your art? Before I built a studio, I would say on my day off, oh, I want to paint. That's what I really want to do. My passion is to paint. But instead, I would weed the garden, and I would get groceries, and I would plan for the birthday party on the weekend or whatever, and I never seemed to find time for my art. When you don't find time for your art, it's like saying you don't find time for yourself. And it's almost like saying it's not important enough to you to work it into your schedule. So for me, when I started taking this more seriously and I said I'm going to be an artist, I went to work as an artist just as I had worked in the corporate world. I got up in the morning, I made my bed, I got dressed, and I didn't come back until the end of the day. I picked up things along the way, put a load of laundry in, put something in the crock pot, and I was in the studio by about 9 or 9.30, and I didn't come out until 6. And when the kids came home and said, Mommy, Mommy, this or that or whatever, I said, that's great, and I'll talk to you at dinner, but right now I'm working. And I didn't say I'm painting, because that didn't seem to work out for me. And when friends called and said, what are you doing? And I'd say, oh, I'm painting. And they're like, oh, well, I thought I'd go over to Yonkers and shop for a little while. Uh, I realized that didn't work for me. So when they'd call I'd, and they'd say, what are you doing? I'd say, well, I'm working right now. Oh, OK, I didn't realize you're busy. I'll check with you later. I'm good. OK, well, I'll call you back about 6. When I took it seriously and carved out the time, then I realized that other people took it seriously as well. And I think carving out time to paint is everything for an artist. I feel like artists, and maybe especially women, are looking for permission to be artists. How did you give yourself permission? Was it tied to, if I make money, then it gives permission? Was it outside of that? What advice would you give to someone looking to give themselves permission to put their family on hold for eight hours and to pursue their art? It's hard, especially for women, maybe harder than men. And men, if they become professional artists, everybody assumes that's how they're making their living. When a woman is trying to be a professional artist, they just sort of think that she's painting when she's not mothering or gardening or being a wife or helping at the church or all the things that are in our lives. Women have a tendency to put themselves on the back burner while they raise their family, and then they put themselves on the back burner while their kids go to college, and then maybe they put themselves on the back burner for this or that. And I think it's important for us to do what makes us happy. I know that if I get really cranky and crabby, my husband will just say, why don't you just go paint something? And I'll realize I need to paint, I need to create, I need to not do these little tedious things I need to be up there creating. So I gave myself permission and I realize now Ray actually did me a favor in saying, well, what about making some money? What about your portion of the income? Because that actually pushed me fast forward into this and I had to get confident much sooner than I would have if I were just working my way into this. If a student comes to me and she says, well, I don't really need to make money at my art, then I will say to them, what do you want to do with your art? Because everybody wants to do something different with their art. If you want to create, do you want to create to enter shows? Do you want to create to reproduce work? Do you want to uh, create so that you can be in the best gallery in town? Do you want to write a book? What do you want to do? And if they say, well, I just want to be a really good artist and I would like to be recognized, then I will say to them, then stop painting all these little things. Think about what you want to paint. Get serious about that painting. Work hard on it. Enter a national show and get to it. Because by painting all these little bitty paintings here and there and putting them away for a week in the flat file and getting them back out, that's not where you're going to get. So I think it's really important to sit down with yourself and say, what are my goals? What do I want out of this? What is my vision? If you don't care a thing about competing and entering and you just want to paint fun floral paintings, then join a garden club and be part of the floral painting and, and do that. But think about what you want. Don't just end up there. Plan to be there. What do you say to people who come to you and say, well, I wasn't born being an artist, I can't be an artist. What do you say to people who think you're either born with it or you're not, and that's it? There are very few geniuses born in any field. Every now and then there's a child prodigy that plays the concert piano and has never had a lesson. Most people have to take piano lessons for 20 years to become a concert pianist, and then they have to go to college and graduate school. 
Same with a doctor, same with an engineer, same with any profession. I think you're born with interest in certain things. If your interest is mechanical like my husband's was, he knew at age 10 that he took everything apart and he needed to go to college to learn how to put it back together and do it well. He knew that's where his interest was and that's what he wanted to be. But he wasn't a born mechanic or a born engineer. He had to learn that. And artists, for some reason, they seem to think that we shouldn't go and study and learn and develop our skills the way other professions do. So I think if you have an interest in it, you have talent. I think that's what talent is. I think it's interest. So I think having the interest is enough. The rest can be learned. Now you teach workshops across the country, live workshops. And what would you suggest to people going into a workshop? What should their expectations be for that workshop? Yours or another teacher's? I think the first thing is to enjoy the experience. And this little thing that we hear a lot lately about trying to stay in the moment, be in the moment, be in the present. People go to a workshop hoping that on Friday afternoon they're going to have something great to take home and show their honey or their kids or whatever, and that doesn't always happen. It has to be about the learning experience. You have to just be willing to try what the instructor does. I have people come to my workshops every day that bring all their stuff and paint the way they do at home because they're a little afraid to get out of their comfort zone. They're afraid they're going to embarrass themselves. They're afraid they're not going to have something good at the end of the week. They're afraid there's going to be a critique and they're going to be embarrassed. I do very gentle critiques because it's not about discouraging somebody. It's about encouraging somebody. And it's about focusing on what you've learned this week and what you've tried this week, not what you've accomplished. So I think people go into workshops expecting to come out with something a little bit decent, and they shouldn't. They should just go there for the experience of learning, having fun, being with other artists. Critiquing is a big part of the way you approach your work and the way you approach your students' work. Why is learning to critique so important? And how would you suggest students critique their work? A lot of the workshops around the country teach some particular technique. You learn how to put a material with a couple materials and you go home with something really fun. But then you say, okay, now I have a flat file full of paintings and I don't know what to do with them. Maybe I did some kind of a wonderful acrylic spray on thing or use some cheesecloth here or there or I collage some stuff on here but how do I make it into a piece of art and so that's where it comes right back to some basic learning personal critiquing is just a matter of learning the tools that are out there and making sure you get them in your piece of artwork I can take anybody's start and help them get going on how to turn this into a finished painting. Just because you get a wonderful puddle of stuff on a piece of Yupo does not necessarily make it a piece of art. It needs some composition, a little bit of design, some of the tools that we're taught. And I think self-critiquing is hard for people. It's hard for me. Our art is personal. And if nothing else, it ought to be personal first. So when you get something that's personal, it's hard to look at it. It's a little bit of you out there in the world for everybody to look at, and you're not sure if you like a little bit of you out there. And you're not sure how to change the look of you on that piece of paper. But I can teach people how to look at their work, how to crop their work, how to change their work, how to warm it up, cool it down, move the focal point, help the transportation through the painting. And that seems to be a little bit of my strength for whatever reason. And I think it goes right back to college. When I picked that I wanted to be a high school art teacher at a young age, and that didn't happen for me, now, in not so young an age, <laughs> I'm getting that gift, that opportunity to teach. And I find that is a gift I have, is being able to help somebody see their work in a better light. You've marketed your husband for years. How is it different marketing yourself, and how important is marketing your work? I so totally believed in my husband, I could market him anywhere. I could say he was the greatest engine builder in the world, and I believed it. I knew he was the cutest. I knew that right off. So I wasn't even shy in picking up the phone and calling a national magazine and saying, you should run an article on Ray Baker. He's doing something really interesting. So when it comes to marketing my business, you'd think I'd be really good at that. But you go back to that old thing. It's very personal. It's very hard to pick up the phone and say, hi, I have something special to offer here. So you don't. You sit back and you hope you'll be discovered. You hope somebody will ask. And then pretty soon, you're having some landmark birthdays. And you're like, whoa, 
If it doesn't happen now, it's not going to happen. So when you find yourself on the banana peel and you're halfway out, you realize that I'm either going to have to speak up for myself or the train's going to pass me by. So in the beginning, I found marketing very hard for myself. I was fortunate because I put this big blast of artwork out there and I started entering some national shows and I started winning some awards. So I got some invitations from magazines to have stories. So a great deal of it came to me in the beginning. But I soon realized that if I didn't promote myself, who would? So now I try to be a little more bold about it and I try to not be so personal about it. I think I do have something to offer. And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, I'm interested in having an article in your magazine if you'd be interested in writing about me. I write goals every year on New Year's Day. I don't make resolutions about losing weight or spending more time with doing this or that. I write art goals. In the beginning, my goal was to get a gallery. My goal was to sell some artwork. And then every year, my goals moved up. And then my goal was to enter a national show and then maybe to win a national award and maybe someday to do a DVD for Creative Catalyst. Check, click, done, done, check, check. Um, so now my goals are a little more lofty. I maybe think about museum shows. I maybe think about history. I might think about books. But I think if you don't make a goal, how will you get there? I have a little quote that I love that says, the whole world steps aside for the person who knows where they are going. And so if you're just wandering along, bumping into every opportunity and saying, nah, not today, no, not today, maybe it's never going to happen for you. If you put something on a list and say, someday I would like to have a museum exhibit, then when that opportunity over a glass of wine and the curator says, we've been thinking about running an exhibit on series, and you think, oh, I have a series of clothespin paintings. That might work. Then I'm not so quick to say, oh no, I, I, I couldn't possibly or I wouldn't be interested because it's already in the back of your mind and it's already on your goal list. So then when the opportunity comes along, I think you're more apt to take it. I kind of think you have to be your own voice, whether it's comfortable or not. We always think it's going to sound like we're boasting, that we're overconfident. And yet when I meet an artist that says, oh yeah, I just got into the new splash, I'm like, oh wow, that's very cool. I don't think, well, they're conceited. I don't think we should be so shy about it. It's just, uh, it's interesting to other people because I'm always interested in what other people are doing. So I could assume they might be interested in what I'm doing. In part two of our two-part interview, Linda talks about pricing work, getting into galleries, entering shows, and much more. To hear both parts of Linda Baker's interview, check back at the Creative Catalyst blog. Linda Baker's DVD, Layers of Design in Watercolor, is available now at ccpvideos.com.